Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. And today I would like to tell you about a theorem in algebraic geometry, or essentially in algebraic geometry, but you don't need to be scared about algebraic geometry because it is a following question. So um, whenever you have a polynomial, you might wonder how many points determine the polynomial. It's kind of a question you ask in very different fields. So how many points determine, how many values would determine whatever I'm looking at? Let's say a polynomial or whatever. And yeah, the theorem is essentially at the border of what happens. It's kind of very fun. We go through it, but it kind of the question, the original question is, how many points do I need to determine whatever? And that's not just a question that is of interest in um, algebraic geometry, but kind of in general, if you think about approximation of functions or something like that. So how many points do you need to determine a certain type of function. And that's kind of the question I would like to ask. And it turns out uh, that nine is a crucial number kind of for some funny reasons that we will explore. And the theorem is essentially due to uh, Bach, Ach, Bach, I have no idea how to pronounce this name. It's a very strange name somewhat. Uh, anyway, and Kaylee has also played a certain role. I'm not going to explain the, the history, but there's an article linked in the description, which kind of, uh, well, Kaylee played a, a slightly weird role. Whatever, whatever. You can you can read the article if you're interested. We're not going uh, into the details of the history. Okay, we start off really really slow with two and one. So two and one. Let me write it down. Nine and nine is the end. It's uh, by it result. So let's write down two and one. Um, and not very surprisingly, I hope everyone agrees that two points here, are two points. Determine a line, right? That's our question. How many points determine a certain type of object? Uh, two points. Let me make them a little bit more visible, maybe bluish. Two points determine a line, right? That's my number two. I hope that's not very, uh, well, very far-fetched here. Two points determine a line. And two unequal lines intersecting one point. Yeah? So here, my little picture of intersecting lines in one point. And you might scream now, so I'm probably be a little bit awake here in this video. You might scream now, well, that's not true. I can have a line and a parallel line. They don't intersect in the point, right? Hmm? Okay, so um, and, and except in almost all cases, my statement was true, but there is this funny case where um, the line and its, its second line, they're just parallel to one another. And actually everything I'm doing is in projective geometry. If you don't know what that means, well, in this case, it would mean that our parallel lines actually cross. So my statement, original statement was true, that every uh, two unequal lines meet in one point. And essentially, well, you don't need to really know what projective geometry is, it doesn't really matter. Essentially for this video, it's a, it, it's a device such that I don't need to go into special cases. Yeah, if I go in a, in a second, I will go to planes and whatever, higher order, sorry, to higher order curves. And then there will be just a, a trillion different cases. But the generic case is kind of what I'm going to describe uh, if you want. And if you go to projective geometry, everything is generic. That's kind of the point. So in this case, I don't need to have a special case of parallel lines. I can just say two parallel lines intersect in one point. Uh, sorry, so yeah, well, they intersected infinity in projective geometry. So I'm going to projective geometry. But the two numbers uh, to keep in mind here are two and one. It's two and one, or the two numbers. The next two numbers are five and three. And again, we ask the same type of question, and this might not be completely obvious, um, but you will see several uh, different special cases uh, as we go uh, along here. So in this case, we have like trillions of different special cases. I'm trying to draw a few, but anyway, um, add a degree Two polynomial, so that's called usually called a conic, a conic section. So like a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, a hyperbola, something along those lines, is determined by five points. So here's a nice picture actually. As soon as you have five points, they all uh, go through those three points, and as soon as you specify two more, you can say whether it's an ellipse. Sorry, this was a circle. Uh, well, a circle is an ellipse, whatever. <laughs> it's a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. So for Degree one things, and that was a linear world, two points were enough. For degree two, five points are enough. And I have no idea why this guy ended up to be a three when I actually say uh, five and four. So here we go, five and four, five and four, obviously. So, and four points are in the intersection of those guys. So if you generically intersect 
a circle with an ellipse or two ellipses, you get four points. And again, keep in mind that we're doing projective geometry in order to avoid some crazy things like they just touch in a point or something like one lies inside of the other or some crap like that. So um, in order to avoid those all, all those special cases, I'll just do uh, projective geometry. And then it's actually true that two unequal conics will intersect in exactly four points. So five and four are our two numbers here. Five and four. And here were our numbers two and one. Yeah? Five and four, two and one. Degree two, uh, sorry, we start with degree one. And then degree two, and now we're going to degree three, and it turns out the two numbers are my thumbnail numbers, uh, nine and nine. So, uh, 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 what is it called? A cubic now, and that's a degree three polynomial equation, like an elliptic curve or something, is determined by nine points. And here's a very nice illustration. So, these nine points actually determine the cubic down here that goes through it. So, nine points determine the cubic. And now comes a fun fact. Yeah, also, nine points, same number, determine the intersection of a cubic. So if you take a cubic and intersect it with itself, again, kind of generically, if you want, and intersect it with itself, generically, intersect it with another cubic, generically, then um, you get nine different... Oh, well, it's a bad color. I see another try. Let's try another color. You get nine different intersection points, right? So generically, the number is nine and nine. And that's kind of interesting because now you have this funny intersection of nine and nine. So here, this doesn't quite work, five and four. So you, you need more points to determine something. You need more points to determine something. And if you go higher, by the way, so you, and then you will have not enough points to determine something. But in this case, it kind of works out, right? Nine and nine. And then there's the theorem, which, um, oh, let me, let me actually try to try to pronounce it. So Kaylee, Kaylee is Kaylee, and this was well, actually a German mathematician, so I should be able to pronounce that name. Um, Bach Arach, possible. But anyway, um, so the theorem then just essentially says nine is nine. So the two intersections of two cubics determine another cubic, right? So you have nine and nine. Um, and formally speaking, I should add something like generic, projective, algebraically closed, whatever. Let, let, let's ignore that. So algebraically closed, for example, is um, I would need to work over the complex numbers instead of the real numbers, but I can't draw pictures of the complex numbers, so I'm completely ignoring that. Anyway, essentially what you should have in mind is generically this is the picture, but you can have some parallel lines, but who cares about parallel lines? Anyway, so it's kind of a nice coincidence here, um, which, um, well, you might, you might say this is a boring theorem, who cares about that? Uh, well, honestly, it, it implies two very, very famous theorems uh, from the history of mathematics, one of them going back to Papus, which is like a really long time. And Pascal is also a long time. And it's kind of this funny coincidence that you hopefully has at one point have seen in your life. Uh, let's say Papus, that if you put, oh, let me try to do that live. That if you put that th two lines and you put three points on the bottom and you put three points on the top and you co connect them to one another in, the, in this hexagonal fashion. So both theorems are usually called hexagon, something like this. One side of the hexagon, another 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 side of the hexagon. And my lines are super not straight. But anyway, the, the theorem would say that there is a third line passing through all those intersection points. That's Papu's theorem, like really classical. And this is a, that this works is essentially a special case or a consequence of the, this theorem above, which is kind of a fun exercise to see why. But anyway, so that this works essentially this nine equals nine uh, coincidence. Similarly for, uh, well, for this Pascal version, which is essentially the same, but instead of having two lines, you have a circle or an ellipse and you put six points on an ellipse and play this hexagon type uh, intersection game with those lines and you find another line that goes through all of them. Okay, so this is kind of the theorem. And the proof is actually not very difficult. Um, obviously, I'm not going to give you the proof. I'm just sketching something. Essentially, it's the following. You can, can kind of write down a formula, a closed formula for the number of intersection points for a degree D curve, for the number of points determining it. Um, let's just do it. Well, let's, let me just tell you what the answer is instead of let's just do it. So D squared for this guy and whatever this one is, a half D squared plus 3D for the other one. So D squared, for example, it would start off with 1, uh, 4, 
uh, nine. These were the, the things we had on the slide, and the next one would be 16. Um, and this one is a little bit more difficult to compute. We had that, so two, uh, five, uh, nine, and now I would need to do the calculation. Uh, so 16 plus 12 over two, 16 plus 12 over two, is that 14? Uh, possible, possible, absolutely possible. And you can see that there's exactly this intersection in degree three, and if you just plot the lines, well, both of them are um, kind of parabolas, so they both grow quadratically, but d squared grows faster than half d squared. Uh, so eventually d squared goes all the way faster along here, here's half d squared, but half d squared is a little bit disturbed by a, by a linear factor, so down here, half d squared is faster, so eventually they intersect, and essentially the whole proof is, well, they intersect in more, a boring point zero and a more interesting point, which is then uh, the degree three intersection. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.